Digital technology offers the promise of intimacy, amazement, and even a longer life. With the ability to do billions of calculations in our pockets, it seems we've discovered a new dimension in which everything in our lives can be improved and tracked and then turned into money. But is convenience, profit, and surveillance the only use for these new powers? Now a new generation of rebel geeks are using their skills to challenge the tech giants and enable a different technological future, one where people are not the product. I like the concept of the unwashed masses that no one respects or thinks they have good ideas coming from. But it's also the people who rise up and overthrow tyranny. I'm a hacker and a troublemaker and an activist. I politically identify as a non-ideological anarchist. We need to look for cows. Cows. Should we go out and find some cows? Should we go cow And we need sugar cane. To, to make more books. You need sugar to make books? We turn the sugar into new paper. Whoa, there we go. I started programming um, when I was five. I learned to read so that I could read programming manuals. There, I got a lava bucket. This is a house that uh, I built with my family and we built it out of papercrete, which is like this recycled paper. What we did was we just built the wall straight up and then we chainsawed out the hole where the windows are gonna be. It's completely off the grid, which means that both the communications up and down go straight to a satellite. I'm actually trying to figure out how to get microwave internet, which is gonna involve putting antennas onto all sorts of mountains to, to bounce signals back and forth to try and get online. So it'll be a bit faster. Living out here, you have to know much more about what's going on with your property. You have to know all the systems. There's no passing it off. In some ways, that's very aligned with hacker culture. You got to get in there and see how it works. Programmers are like digital superheroes. Everybody else gets to use the technology, the reality in which we play, but the, the programmers, we get to reshape the rules, the physics of our digital universe. Searching for cell phone signals. The values of hacker culture, the values of social movements, exist more in startups than we ever think. Capitalism is an astounding belief that the most wickedest of men will do the most wickedest of things for the greatest good. John Maynard Keynes. Oh, this is great. This is one of my favorite shirts. And on the back, more world, less bank. And the dates, mobilized for global justice. The end of November 1999, the World Trade Organization was going to negotiate a new round where companies could go in and overturn a country's laws and fine countries if the countries passed laws that, that hurt their profits. And so there was a very large protest, maybe 50,000 people. The WTO was supposed to be a shining moment for Seattle, but as we know, it didn't turn out that way. As the world watches, demonstrators determined to disrupt the World Trade Organization smash window. Media was a centralized thing. Crash downtown. They created the narrative and the message. And so indie media had this radical concept that activists, that anyone concerned about the world and social change should no longer focus on convincing journalists to cover their stories, but they should make the media themselves. We have to find our own ways to get the message out. The revolution will not be televised by the corporate media. The couple days before the protest, I walked in and joined as a volunteer. 
spent the whole protest inside just smelling the tear gas floating under the doors. Building software that let people go online and publish their own news. We have decided to stop to cry today and start mobilize grassroots. The power is in the people. We came from Japan for protest to WTO. A very exciting thing is emerging here in Seattle in people's opposition to the World Trade Organization. We set it up so that people were doing live streaming video in the streets. We had laptops with all sorts of complicated network equipment, published photos, published video. In the late 90s, that was a very rare and innovative thing. That trade agreement ended up not being passed. That moment proved to be a shift where I said, okay, I'm going to quit my job. I'm gonna try and build software for social change full time. And so I spent four years setting up computer labs and websites for anti-globalization groups. So you missed the raspberries, but there's, there still are strawberries. There's still are raspberries. There's still raspberries. My friend's Tad Hirsch. He'd been trying to figure out how to build technology for activism too. He had this text message alert system for protests. And it was something called TextMob. TextMob. In the summer of 2004, IAA researchers produced TextMob, a cell phone text message broadcasting system. TextMob allows activists who are distributed throughout a city to remain organized during chaotic street protests. The Republican convention in 2004 was in New York, and Bush was the president running for re-election on the campaign of continuing the occupation in Iraq. So by this time, we had any media sort of Tweet-like messages, single sentence, uh, you know, 150, 140 character long messages that were breaking news updates, and we provide these every few minutes. Protesters were able to bypass preemptive police tactics by sharing information on undercover officers and police movements. TextMob was a bit of an improvised system, but the basic idea was that users would have their cell phones. and they would send messages to a server going online saying, I want to sign up for TextMob and these are the information I want, I want to be a member of these groups. And we had this PHP web server, and the PHP web server would say, great, what's your phone number and what's your email provider? And the, the, then it would send email providers, emails, to the company, Sprint, AT&T, AT-Mobile. And that would then send a email message that became an SMS. And those would go back and forth. The problem was AT&T very soon discovered this and said, you can't do that. Give us lots of money. Being a bunch of activists who didn't have a lot of money, um, we decided that we weren't going to do that. And instead what we built was a sneaky system around that. We built a what is called a peer-to-peer -peer network and we build a little Java applet and we put that applet in the Indie Media web page. And whenever we wanted to send an SMS, we sent it out to all of these little applets running on many thousands of people's computers. That applet would then do the communication to the AT&Ts of the world from a new IP address, and it says, oh, you're a unique person, you're, you've not done this anymore. And AT&T says, happily, I'll deliver a couple SMSs for you, but not a lot. And it started working, and so we built this system that let us send 40 to 50,000 SMSs an hour through TextMob without, uh, without having to pay for any of it. TextMob, indie media, and the other activism work is a, a major precursor to what has become social media. I was a broke activist traveling around, living in a VW bus that I bought for $200. And, and I saw this contract on Craigslist listing a company trying to create a new media of communication. And I was like, I'm all for democratizing the media. 
I'll do this. This is the picture. It's not a very good picture. But that's, that's the demo of the original Twitter. And we videoed it, and then the video got lost. So this is the original team that got split off to work on Twitter. So when we, we divided up the teams internally. So it's Florian, Jack, and Noah. Um, and it looks like their picture is taken in a club or something. The whole team said, let's look at text messaging. Let's look at social networks. Let's look at building stuff. When we took TextMob and looked at it, we said, well, OK, this is interesting but it doesn't have the social model that blogging has. And so the transition from Twitter to TextMob is that that reading relationship and, and the API and the, the openness of the web. Over the summer that it went on, I actually personally, after we launched Twitter, quit. I didn't realize what I myself was doing by partially the team that I helped create and hire and partially the, the way the technology worked and, and a part of its roots in TextBob and other projects. I didn't realize the values that went into it because you don't have to be conscious of the values that you're putting in things when you do it. sort of the biggest commercially focused uh, open source conference in the United States. There's IBM and there's PayPal and Microsoft and um, they don't necessarily agree exactly with my politics, but there's none of this like you should be shunned because you want to overthrow capitalism. How are you? <laughs> Come here. Yeah. I want to show you something. Uh -huh. Good. The couple years I, I worked on Twitter and then seeing it grow totally changed my life. I've done a lot of interesting projects and I've traveled around the world and built lots of software. And it's a good one. It's a box. You built a box. Yeah. It's in the box, so exactly. it doesn't escape. And then one day I was talking to some people about how to build software for oil rigs. And I realized that as interesting as the problem was, I'd lost track of the desire and the need to focus more directly on changing the world. And so uh, I wrapped up my projects and everything else. I said that I needed to refocus and apply the lean startup techniques, apply big data, apply startup technology, open source, all these other things, back to the activist world. And that's, that's where I am now. We're heading up to Seattle. We're going to drop in on a new project called LEAP. And LEAP is an organization and software project that's been working for a number of years to create secure communication. It was a very big problem with the way our email and mailing lists, the way our communications work. People think that they're sending a private letter, and it turns out that what they're sending are postcards. The LEAP team reached out to me because I'm one of the people that has bridged the gap between the activist world and the startup world. There are not a lot of anarchist angel investors. And so they wanted to find someone who could advise them on, on raising money, on being a viable startup, while at the same time knowing that they don't want to abandon the larger political vision of why they're doing it.
I think it's, it's really, really important to have the capacity to organize without all of your information mm. being completely exposed. I, I think it's an existential question for social change in general. I don't think that it will be possible in the future without the capacity to communicate securely. Whether it's behavior tracking, whether it's business intelligence, or what other forms of analytics, it's, it's the data that matters. Well, I'm not convinced you're right. Unlike most people in the, tech ra the radical tech community, I've, I've worked within that startup world. I have a pretty good idea how it works. The people who collect all that big data, they're, they're gonna stumble into more efficient solutions than the people who use intuition. I guess taking a step back, I would say all aspects of governance are increasingly becoming systems of code and analysis and data. And certainly the lesson out of uh, the dot bomb of 2000 um, when the NASDAQ internet stocks lost 80% of their value in a week was that the companies left standing were the ones with the biggest databases. And so that, trans that lesson and that transformation has led to you know, this current rise of surveillance as a business model. But surveillance is really a subset of this process of um, social control through data. Mm -hmm. And that to go and work for Silicon Valley is not selling out in the sense of like, oh, that band used to be cool and they sold out and made money. It's not, it's not like selling out, it's like switching sides. Using our labor, it's very important to be building something that is not potentially part of a dark dystopia. When you go and work for Silicon Valley, the current game is building technology that could be used for totalitarian social control. But if you don't collect data, if you don't run experiments and get the stats on it, then you're just going to be not as good. To achieve the larger political aims, it needs to be something that exists and can get widespread adoption. And that's a, that's a company in this world today. You know, I spent five years traveling around setting up protests and, and building community centers and technology for activist groups with the goal of changing the media. And the, the project which I told my friends I was selling out to work at the startup had a larger effect of transforming the media. Twitter. Facebook or Twitter, it's a very good way for communication. It has no power of control from anyone. It's not like the media, like the TV, our Egyptian TV or whatever, they are controlling everything. Now there is no control. I just make a capture of any video or, or picture, I just upload it. Very little actual protests are coordinated on, on Twitter. But the public sphere and the personal feeling about them is completely driven by it. It let people share ideas and memes and share photos and share video and shape the media and shape their own narratives. Activists, only people who wanted to achieve social change use a technology that it's very easy to get rid of. So in the case of text mob, it was easy to eventually block and shut it down because people only used it at protests. But when people use Twitter at protests, Twitter got used for lots of other things. Justice. To transform the world and the way we make social change, we need the tools of social change be used in people's everyday lives for things that have nothing to do with social change.
We're at the Chaos Computer Club camp. It happens every four years. It's where the European hacker community gets together and hangs out and plays and connects with each other in a face-to-face -face real world. This is the community that created WikiLeaks. This is the community that created Tor. This is a, you know, the community that says that privacy is important. This is the, the, the communities that built the internet. <laughs> It's uh, camping with power cables and computers. As long as it doesn't rain, it's great, but when it rains, it's everybody rushed to, to hit the circuit breakers and turn off the power to all the tents. What, what I want to know uh -huh. um, is what do you think we should do, like just be brutally honest, about how we should get uh, the Indian encrypted email into the hands of let's not say a million, mm -hmm. let's say a billion people, and like like what should we do like next a next month b next year? Leap needs to uh, launch products under different names, with different designs, with different sales pitches and everything else, to see what people will sign up for. You would basically say let's build two web pages. Let's build 20. two. Or, okay, let's just let's just begin with two because I can't think of twenty things at once. <laughs> and then one one web page says, "Here's this VPN. It's great." And we see how many people sign up for that. And then another page says, "Email. It's great." And we see how many people sign up for that. Every single thing you think you can do on the Leap platform, yeah. Make it you different. launch okay. before you build it. The startup world has figured out how to do stuff and <clears throat> do things that make their software work better and we think that's selling out. If you don't do the experiments at all, you'll never build something that gets used. But I think like the problem is uh, with the people here is because they know that, if it, they, 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 they kind of realize that uh, the startup stuff might work, um, that there's some techniques there, but when they see startup people and they see that the people who work in startups are directed primarily by money or by fame, I mean, everyone here is camera shy. No one here wants to be famous. People want to be anonymous. And, and thus, like, I kind of think that, um, that, 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 that actually it's causing like this weird um, paradox where they're like, we know in order, to, we need, in order to be successful as revolutionaries, we need everyone to use this stuff. I think that's like the, the, the disconnect. It's almost an ethical dis disconnect, but it's not necessarily a disconnect of the techniques themselves. I want to talk a little bit about why people are using startups or corporations communication software and why they're not using our stuff. And in particular, I want to encourage us to steal ideas and techniques from, from the capitalists and the startup community. It's, it's a race that we face. It's a race between different applications. To get secure communications, we need to win that race. And right now, we're, we're not going to win that race. Right now, we have all these different projects very bravely and valiantly fighting out there, and we're not learning quickly. So we need, we need to build things that, that people will use. We need to build things that people want to use, build things that people love. As software developers, as people who work in startups, as people who care about the future of the world, we have to look at where technology is being built, how it's being built, what values go into it, because those are the values that will then shape future society.